appearance um, sharing before we began the class. But anyway, um, I really wanted to introduce good literature to students and, and their families, which is well-written and God-honoring, okay? It's not particularly labeled this book as a, a Christian book, but the principles and the values that are promoted in it um, are, are biblical, consistent with the Bible. And it was, um, you know, to, to be able to read something that is edifying and not destructive to us, that is really, um, it was great. And um, the main character was based closely on an actual person in history who suffered from poverty, being misunderstood, unfairly treated. He lost close family members at a young age. He was often, often or sometimes at least discouraged, faced loneliness. And so we can un identify with him in his emotions, even if not in his exact cir circumstances. And I felt that he really showed us, not merely told us how to respond to adversity in God's way. For example, when he, he had to leave his home at age 12 because his, his family really suffered from poverty. Um, Nat had, well, even before that, he had to leave formal education and he, he, he went to live outside of his home. And it was a contract for nine years, starting at the age of 12. So this was not his ideal situation. But after he had his moments of sadness, he determined to take the experience that was ahead of him um, as an opportunity to learn, actually, and to improve himself. And he did not fill himself with self-pity. He continued in his loving relationship with his siblings and his father and his mother had passed away. Um, and he remained, he maintained a respectful attitude to all those he met. And later as a seaman, he also treated everybody with respect and honor, despite others' treatment of him um, or their attitude towards him. And he used his understanding and his skills to benefit others. And in the end, he benefited himself because he built, he earned a reputation of being a man of humility and integrity at the same time um, known for his high ability. And he even reached a level of being a ship's captain. Okay, so, um, you know, so really the main purpose besides introducing this piece of literature um, was I, I wanted us all to learn how a person can really live out the Bible verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall make straight your path. Okay, um, we often quote this verse and other wonderful sounding verses, but how we actually play, you know, place our lives on it and, and are able to, um, you know, as, as Nat Bowditch did. Um, and the, the book that Nat, Nat Bowditch published over 200 years ago is still used today on ships and um, in schools of navigation. Um, of course, it's being updated because of um, technological advances. Um, but his very life brought glory and honor to God. And, and I think that is the lesson that I would want all of us to take away from, from this book. Um, another reason why I wanted to share this book was because it's a really good example of how to do a unit study. Um, and the, what we did during the class, all these five weeks was something you could do at home. You know, um, So what we did was we, we read the book as a, a work of literature, but every time we came across you know, something in history or, you know, there, there was, there, there's art in, in the book, um, beautiful illustrations. Um, there's mathematics, astronomy, um, music. We talked a little, little even about the food at the time. Um, 
we kind of, it seemed like we went off on a lot of tangents, but, but we got a very, very full picture of the setting of, of this book. And, um, and also another purpose I had was I wanted everyone to develop good habits of how to be organized, to take notes. And so we, we everybody was required to set up a notebook with um, tabs, a different section. So we, we had um, e either notebook or binder. So the first section was Bible verses. Every week we focused on a Bible verse, which was demonstrated in Nat Bouch's life. Um, okay, we pointed out life lessons, lessons from Nat's life as he had to face a lot of adversity and how he responded. And I like that he wasn't like a, a cardboard figure. He, he wasn't just like, oh, uh, goody two shoes, we'd say. He, he was definitely a human being. He had times of discouragement and, you know, he got frustrated, but, that, but he never sat in that. And he, he went on to have a, a really godly response. And okay, we, we had a section in, in our notebooks on English and then we, we discussed 15 points or tips about writing that I hope that you can refer to as you do your writing. Um, nautical terms, there is so many nautical terms. We could just fill up the whole notebook with nautical terms and um, you know, which I, I learned a lot myself about military time and things like that. Okay, and then we had a section on mathematics because mathematics definitely comes into play in, in navigation. And we pointed out different individuals in mathematics and, and it turned out that uh, a number of mathematicians from long ago, they're very famous, were actually very, very devoted Christians and their faith actually enhanced their excitement and their, um, you know, their, their understanding of the field. Um, we talked about astronomy and we, very importantly of all, we also, we kept a timeline of Nautich's life, okay? And in, his, in the timeline, we also made note of certain other, well, just a couple of, notes of about the Revolutionary War. Okay, and, and then we had our, okay, we had our maps. Okay, so we, we also, we, everybody printed out the maps and we, we had the, the routes of the five journeys that Nat made. Okay, um, yeah, so rather, you know, rather than just talk about oh, how interesting it was that Nat kept notebooks and he was so disciplined. I, I hoped to inspire everybody to have, have the habit of, of um, keeping good notes and uh, taking it as maybe a method to, to learn um, and to explore different subjects. Okay, and so I think that's about all I want to say myself. And so we're gonna start our presentations, okay, they're listed in, in the chat under section B, and the times are just approximate there. Um, and, okay. So, let's see. so we're gonna start with uh, Sarah, Christine, and Jenny. Um, their project was Bible verse and art, uh, because Nat Bowditch in, in the book, he actually starts learning different languages using John 1.1, 1, 1. Um, in the beginning was the word. And he takes that verse and then looks at Latin, French, Spanish, and, and he, he learns these languages which are actually helpful for him on his voyages. Okay, so I'll give the floor to Sarah, Christine, and Okay, okay so you're gonna share your slides. Yeah, so we have separate slides. Okay. Okay, so I'll be going first. All right.
Okay, can you see that? Yes. All right. Okay. Sorry. So, my um my assignment was Bible and languages. Um and basically I chose the language Greek. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be reading um john 3 16 in greek and i'll give you guys a brief summary on the background of greek i guess yeah so this is john 3 16 in greek um you may see some letters they they look very similar to the english letters but they're not if you can see here, this word right here, T-O-V, it means the, but it's actually pronounced um, ton. Can you see that? Okay, cool. So now I'm going to go ahead and read it for you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, anyways, here it is. Okay, let me read it out loud. Hotos gar e gepsan ho dias tan kosman hoste tan hyon tan monagin. Idoken hina pas ho pestian is aiton me apolitai al ichi zoin. I own neon. Okay. Well, that's that. My my pronunciation may not be completely accurate, but that's Greek. Um, one thing is the grammar structure is also really different from the English structure. So if you guys are interested in that, you could do some of your own research. All right. Okay, and I'm going to be giving you guys a brief summaries about Greek missionaries. And the first missionary I have, his name is John Henry House, and he lived from 1845 through 1936. So he was a missionary known for his work te teaching agriculture techniques to Bulgarian and later Greek peasants. And he was both the head of a school and the youngest man in the mission. So um, in his he was the president of a school and while he was um while he was in there it went from 15 to 20 students to 75 students and he taught the students in his school um a lot of things also including a lot of god in there right and he was a missionary to the children and he was also missionaries to the Bulgarian and Greek peasants. And he taught them agriculture techniques and also led um, Bible group studies with them and taught them many things about God. Um, his work was even recognized in America and he was presented with the award of divinity of doctrine while he was in his early forties. Um, the other two uh, missionaries to Greece was Andrew the Apostle and Paul the Apostle, and both of them um, were one of Jesus' direct disciples, if, and I know all of you guys are pretty familiar with them. Um, here on the right, you can see Paul's travels, and if you can look at the colors, you can see that on his second and third missionary trip, he has gone through Greece. Um, although the Bible doesn't directly um, talk about him in Greece, a lot of biblical philosophers can see some parts in the Bible where it might be in Greece. So yeah, anyways. Um, Greece, ancient Greece is known as the cradle of Western civilization. And as you all probably all know, the Olympic games are in Argent originated from Greece. Um, so that's really fun. Also, the architecture 
in Greece is also very popular. As you can see here is the Parthenon of the Acropolis of Athens in Greece. And it's the famous, it's the famous Parthenon of the main landmark of Athens. It's the ruins of a majestic temple on the top of Acropolis Hills. And this is the ancient Greek architecture of Athens in summer. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so Athens, I'm pretty sure you guys are all pretty familiar with that too, because the Greeks also has Greek myths. And Greek myths um, are basically the, the stories of Zeus and Athens and also Cupid. So that's fun. And so overall, Greece is just a great place. It's very, it's biblical and it's pretty popular and played a big role in Western civilization. And it is also a great tourist spot with a lot of um, ancient Greek architecture. Okay, so thank you, that's mine. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. That was, that was very informative and um, that was interesting how you showed the in, interlinear Bible there. We could see the, yeah, the, the, the you know, word by word there. That was great. Um, yeah, it, it, what, what you said about the missionary was interesting too, because you mentioned he was, he knew about agriculture. And then I thought about William Carey, who was, he was the father of modern missions, right? You know, I don't know if you know, he was also a botanist, you know? And so a missionary will go places, also share whatever their own, um, you know, um, understanding their skills are you know, with the people. And so William Carey actually translated, I just looked up the Bible fully into six other languages and into 29 other parts of the Bible, into 29 other languages. So. Anyway, okay, great. Thank you so much, Christine. That, that was really interesting. And I, I like to see those, you know, the Greek letters there. We, we've mentioned some Greek letters, you know, over these past five weeks too. Okay, all right, so, okay, so Sarah or Jenny, gonna go next? Yeah, it's my turn. Okay, so, hello. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So my um, verse was in Korean. And so um, basically I wrote it. So it's in like, like the Korean letters and I had the pronunciation. So it's easier for me to read. So I'm going to read it now. Um, Hananim isisangil icholam salang hasa Doxin Julio Bonasius Uni Medinum Jamada Mayo Lamanchi and Go Yon San Il Ud Il Amen. Um, so I don't think I pronounced it correctly, but I don't exactly know how to. So this is how did South Koreans get to know God. So South Koreans started knowing God when Catholics brought the knowledge to them, to them. The Catholics learned about it from China and brought it to Korea. They were French and Chinese missionaries that brought the log to Korea. South Korea, also known as the downtown of Korea, supports religious freedom, Confucianism, Buddhism, and Christianity are the main formal religions. This is a map of South Korea. Are there any religions in North Korea? North Korea is the east part of Asia where public religion is discouraged. Korean shamanism and conditism are the religions that people practice in North Korea. Though they are restricted to the freedom of religion, many practice in small groups. And this is a map of North Korea. Horson Allen. Horson Allen was the first Protestant missionary to Korea. After he helped a wounded homeless, a royal relative joined the 
Jepson coat. He became close to the king of Josian Gohan. Allen was also a physician and an American ambassador to Korea. And that's all I have. Okay, hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, well, I, I appreciate you, you and Christine also, you know, um, looking at the verses in, in these, you know, Greek and, and Korean, which we're not familiar with ourselves, but just, you know, that was still um, good of you to do that. And, you know, I was, I was thinking really, sometimes we think about North Korea and, and I, I just think, oh, it's, I want to avoid going there. It's it seems so scary, you know. We've heard in the past of, of missionaries who would, you know, uh, have you know, either be somehow tortured or, you know. But but then I realized, you know, we we really should still pray for the people there. Every person there is a person just like you and I. And we we also need to to think, well, wow, how privileged we are that we can know. God and freely speak about him in America. And um, of course, God can still reach people in, in you know, all, all places. We really pray for the country of North Korea. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, and okay, I think so Jenny is. Yeah, let uh, me share screen. Uh, for Bible languages, I chose the language Spanish as my uh, language to talk about. Sources from information I got was the internet. Spanish cultures and traditions. This is the uh, Bible verse, John 3.16 in Spanish. Uh, I will read this and then explain some of the Spanish traditions and cultures. Por qué tanto amo Dios el mundo que dio a su hijo unigénito para que todo el que cree en él no se pierda, sino que tenga vida eterna? It might not be accurate to how it's actually pronounced, but I tried. So this is Bible verse John 3.16 in Spanish. Spanish is a country with many traditions and cultures. For example, flamenco. It's perhaps the most famous Spanish tradition, but also one that is often misunderstood. Flamenco is not a dance, but does sometimes have dancing in it. Rather, it's a musical style with far more emphasis on the guitar, vocals, and rhythm than on dancing. The exotic traditions you see on TV or on the internet make Spanish a wonderful country. Now, uh, this is the Spanish missionary information I have. Spanish is a country that had 21 missionaries. Spanish missionaries were people who, sent, who were sent by the Roman Catholic Church and the Spanish royal authorities to other lands to share the gospel with people. The Spanish missionaries in the, in the Americas were Catholic missionaries established by the Spanish empire during the 16th to 19th centuries in the period of the Spanish colonization of the Americans. These missions were scattered throughout the entirety of the Spanish colonies, which extended from Mexico and south southwestern port portions of the current day United States to Argentina and Chile. Right now, uh, we have more missionaries in Spanish, but in the past, they only had 21. These missionaries uh, had traveled around and spread the word of God and had many Bible groups to study with others because back in the day, not many people really believed in God and they didn't know much. That's it for my presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, yeah, as, I guess it depends where you live, but here in New York, we, we hear a lot of Spanish around. Um, so, um, are, are you taking that as a foreign language in, in school, Jenny? Oh, uh, yeah, in middle school, I'm going to do Spanish. Oh, okay. All right, great. Um, 
Yeah, so thank you, Jenny and Sarah and Christine. That was like um, very informative. And, you know, we, we could take just, so just like Nat Bowditch in, in the book, he took one verse, right? John 1, 1, and he, he had basically, we're told a dictionary and a grammar book and this Bible verse. And studying um, very carefully, he was able to piece together um, you know, the meanings and, and, and the structure of, of the language. And, um, and, but just the pronunciation, he did have to have help with um, how, how to pronounce them. Okay, thank you so much. And we're gonna go on to, wait, our second group is Shoshana, Phoebe, and Charity. And their topic is Pascal's Triangle because in, in the book, we came across some number patterns and Pascal's triangle is full of number patterns. So I thought that would be good for everybody to learn about. Also the man that you'll hear about Pascal. So uh, Shoshana comes to us by recording and then there's Phoebe and Charity. Share. Okay, so I'm gonna share screen. Okay. So um, I need to make sure I can share some. Okay, so welcome to Pascal's Triangle. So we're gonna start with the introduction by Shoshana, but she's not here, so we're gonna play video. Okay. Hello and welcome to Pascal's Triangle. This is Shoshana and I'll be taking you on the introduction. Pascal's triangle is a pyramid array of binomial coefficients. It was invented in 1665 by French mathematician Blaise Pascal. The triangle can be constructed by first placing a 1 along the left and right edges. The triangle is also known as the Yang Hui Triangle as it originated in China. Pascal's triangle is used for probability and combinations. It can go on forever. Okay, so that's her part, and then, oh, oops. okay, okay, so this is just what she said, and she's in Pennsylvania right now, so, yeah, she's not here. Okay, now is how it works, so basically, it's just a triangle, and the outer layer of it, as you can see, it's made out of ones, so we're going to start, like, here, so, like, one plus one equals two, and that's a sum. And so they would go down in a diagonal um, and you would get the sum, which is two. And then you would keep on going one plus two equals three. And then here's the sum. And then two plus one equals three. And then three plus three equals six. And then one plus three equals four. And three plus one equals four. And so this just keeps on going. It just like keeps on going. So this could go on forever. This is just a really sh uh, small diagram of Pascal's strength. Okay. Next is the history of Pascal's triangle by Phoebe. Uh, Phoebe, uh, this is your part. Looks like Phoebe's not here right now. Um, oh, she's here. Okay. Is Phoebe here? Yeah, I think she's getting her uh, stuff pulled. We can't hear you, Phoebe. Can you please check? Uh, let's see.
Uh, you might want to like check your audio. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Okay, so uh, Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician, physicist, inventor, philosopher, writer, and Catholic theologian. So he was a prodigy who was taught by his father, who was a tax collector. He had two older sisters named Gilberte and Jacqueline, and his, and his mother and father's names were Antoinette Bigon and Etienne Pascal. Pascal was Abbas Pascal was born on June 19, um, 1623 in Clermont Ferrand, France, and died of a stomach tumor in August 19, 1662 in Paris. So Hmm. He he invented the early digital calculator, Schrödinger and Rowlett machine, whatever that is. And the Pascal triangle originated in China, and Pascal didn't come up with the triangle, except instead it was made by a Chinese mathematician, and his name was Yang Hui. In China, they named it after the Chinese mathematician, but in Europe, it's named after Blaise Pascal. Okay, so yeah, after Pascal went through all that, we have Pascal's triangle. Okay, thank you. That's all we have. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, Pascal also, people may not realize he was a very devoted Christian, and he's known for a um, this quote, which is, there is a God-shaped vacuum in every person okay in other words we, there's an emptiness or some need in every single person and people trying to find what can satisfy me what can make me happy is it having a lot of money or a, a, you know um, a lot of possessions or being very smart um, or beautiful um, but pascal said there's a god-shaped vacuum in every person okay um, so I hope you'll re remember Pascal when you, you will come across him in, in your academic work, if you've not already. Um, he's also um, known for this. Um, I don't know. Let me see if I could put myself on pin. Uh, oh, could I be put, put on pin video? I seem not to be able to do that. Let me see. Um, be on he be under. I want to be on the pin video. I don't know what's that mean. Pin video. I I mean to be like a full screen myself. You are. I am. Oh, okay. I can because on my end I don't see myself. Let me okay. change the way you view. It. Oh, okay. Click on the view. And right. Okay. You can change to speaker oh, view. Okay. okay. Sorry. Okay, yeah. So I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with this. Is, um, this is um, this is called a binomial. If it, and so if you've done you know this level of mathematics and you raise it to a power and you want to figure out how do you expand this, this is a topic called binomial expansion. If you expand this, this is what the, the polynomial you will get. And the coefficients that means the numbers are in front of the x y terms here, they would be one, because if you don't see a number, it just means one, three, three, one. And these numbers are actually the um, fourth row of Pascal's triangle. And so you, you can just, you know, if you, if you raise x plus y to another number here, you would be able to find these coefficients from another row of the, um, of the triangle. Anyway, that's just a little aside. But so, um, another humorous thing I think about Pascal's triangle is, yes, it, the, the Chinese are actually um, credited with discovering this triangle. And 
I, I found it in my a, a, a geometry book, but it was upside down in Chinese. But apparently the uh, publisher was not aware of the, you know, what Chinese letters. I don't know how, you know, but somehow they put it upside down. Okay, so thank you very much, um, Shoshana, Phoebe, and Charity for telling us about Pascal's triangle. Okay, there are, you know, patterns going across and patterns going diagonally. Um, it's a very, you know, I, I encourage you to look, look this triangle up. Actually, there's a really um, understandable website called Math is Fun, just one word, Math is Fun. And if you look up Pascal's triangle has, um, you know, all the different patterns of numbers in it, very interesting. Okay, all right, so we're gonna go on to uh, our third group, Caleb and Eason, and they are going to tell us about cartography or map making. Um, and that's related to our book because maps are critical for both land and sea navigation. Okay, or at least they you know, come into play. Okay, so Caleb and Eason. Um, Eason is not here, so do I still present? Oh, yes, go ahead. Okay. Can you see my screen? Um, it's coming. Okay, do you see it? Yes. Okay, cartography. Introduction. Good afternoon. Today, my group member and I will explain to you what cartography is and how maps helped us in our everyday life. Also, do you know who Matthew Mori is? Well, if you don't know, you're in the right place. What is cartography? Cartography is the study and practice of making and using maps, using science, art, cartography, building on a premise that reality can be modeled in ways that communicate spatial information effectively. Uh, maps and navigation on the seas. In the 1700s, Europe map makers knew only about half the Earth's surface with any detail. Rival nations were exploring the seas in search of greater wealth and power. To make ocean travel safer and faster, people had to develop better maps, better navigation tools and techniques, and better clocks. These would help them to travel faster and safer. How were maps invented? Maps of the ancient world were created by using accurate surveying, su surveying techniques, which measures the position of various objects by calculating the distance and angles between each point. Who were the first ones to navigate on the seas? The first people, the first people to explore the, nav explore the seas were, uh, I don't know how to say this word, wait. Phoenicians? Oh yeah, oh, sorry, um, Phoenicians. About 4,000 years ago, Phoenician sailors would use charts in the sun to see where they're going. This is how they knew where they were going. Okay. I think you have to put it back to full, full screen. Okay, Matthew Morey's search for the secret of the seas. Matthew Morey was an American naval officer and oceanographer. He loved reading the Bible. An accident made him leave the Navy, and for 19 years, he researched cloud, weather, and winds, and read the Bible. When Maury was reading the Bible, he kept on thinking about a verse in Psalm 8 that said, Whatsoever pass through, this, pass through the paths of the seas. Maury determined that if God's word said there were paths in the sea, that he might, then there must be paths, so he set out to find them. Maury studied old journals of sailors and developed charts of, charts of ocean currents. In 1855, he wrote a book describing oceanography from a Christian view in which he included the Bible. He died 18 years later in 1873. Conclusion. In conclusion, we hope you learned a thing or two about maps and about Matthew Morey. Thanks for listening to the presentation. And this is a bibliography. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. Um, I'm sorry, Ethan, for not being with us, but I guess he, he, was, he helped you when we both worked together on this. Somewhat. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and, and I think 
Matthew Mori is, is is very interesting in his life that he you know he had an accident as Kayla mentioned, and and so he could not go out as a seaman, but he stayed back um, in in the offices and did you know studies and um, he was able to um, tell us about um, the currents and and so. I think that's a good example of how something we, we might think of it as, as a, a catastrophe, you know, something that, oh, you know, this is going to really ruin what's ahead for us. But actually, God still used what happened to him. And, and same thing with Nat, right? Sorry. Um, he was indentured for nine years. And, and to, to many of us, or most of us, we would say, well, that's it. Um, I'm not going anywhere after this, but he took the opportunity to study whatever he could, and and um, he he really, you know, I think I'm sorry, this a little insect on the page. You know, I think because of the time that he had to study, he was able to later on become that great navigator that he did. You know, so a, a lot of things that happen to our, in our lives, we. We will, we will, you know, if we look at it in, in with the right perspective, we, we can still gain a lot from it, you know. Um, all right, so thank you, Caleb. All right, we're going to hear from Corey and Christopher about weather and navigation. Um, and I, th I think we, we, we all would realize that weather would affect navigation. Um, tremendously. So I'm going to be sharing the screen for them. Um, Christopher, okay, and Corey, you all, all ready? Okay, all right. Scientists, okay, scientists, sorry, go ahead. Weather effects on navigation, presented by Christopher Wong and Corey Chen. Bad weather can cause the ships and boats to run into other ships or objects, to overturn in the water to, or to run aground. It is very helpful for ship navigators to know what kind of weather. Weather over land is not the same as weather over water. The most important forces over water are winds that can um, make big ocean currents that move across the water, uh, by moving across the water. Gyres are small currents that move along the edges of big currents. These big and small currents cause most of the um, weather over the current, oh, 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 over the ocean. Dangerous weather. Weather can, be, can make big waves cause swells that can be dangerous. Big waves among small waves are called root waves that can cause a lot of damage. Predicting weather. Bad weather can be dangerous, but if we forecast the weather, it will help prevent accidents on land. Good predicting can help navigators and sailors know what kind of weather is coming ahead so that they can get ready and be safe. Scientists use weather ships, weather buoys, and weather satellites to predict the weather over oceans. Uh, that's what a weather ship looks like. This is the weather buoy, what it looks like. And that's the weather satellite. So there are sources. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay. Um, all right. I really, really appreciate you presenting that to us. <laughs> um, yeah, interestingly, uh, you know, the word buoy, I, I learned that in, in Great Britain, it's pronounced boy. Maybe some of you know that, right? But for some reason in America, we pronounce it buoy, you know. But, you know, there's the word buoyant, right? B-U-O-Y-A-N-T, but, and we say buoyant, we don't say buoyant, but anyway but we say buoy in, in America. And you might see some of those if you go out into the ocean, you know. Okay, thank you very much. That's great. Um, okay, our fifth group, Alexander 
and Alex and Jim, math and navigation. How do you get voice game? You can hit view and then present. Or, or over there is fine too. Oh, it's a I'll present. Or you can just present. Wait, where's it at? Uh, mathematics and navigation uh, from Alexander and Jim. Oh, sure. Bugged. I, I think you just have to go back all the way up to the top. Don't worry. Okay. Um, introduction. Hi, I'm Alexander, and our group project is to learn about mathematics and navigation. Navigation relies on heavy on mathematics. This is definitely true in the year not voted sailed. Three inventions navigation in those years. Eh. The three inventions made navigation in those years possible: the sextant, the chronometer, and, a, and logarithms. John Bird was a fin famous mathematic math mathematical instrument maker who lived in England during the 18th century. He is credited to, credited with creating the first sextant. This was used to determine the angle between a celestial body, which like 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 the moon or a star, and the horizon. And the sextant became really useful for navigation. John Harrison. John Harrison was a clockmaker and invented the marine chronometer. 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 That solved the, the problem of calculating longitude while at the sea. The hindrance was that this invention was really expensive. Therefore, not every ship had it, but it is true, a surely useful. Um, John Napier was a famous mathematician, physicist, and astronomer. He created logarithms to help the sailors calculate where they were at sea. If a number is raised as a base, raised to an exponent, the logarithm or log of the number is the exponent. For example, if 2 cubed equals 8, we say that the log of 8 base 2 is 3. Um, Napier was born on February 1, 15, uh, 1550, into a rich family and had private tutors to teach him. He later went to a private school. John Napier was a very devoted Christian. He considered, uh, considered his, uh, I mean, Christian writings about the church, a point of discovery of the whole revelation of St. John to be his greatest achievement. A fun fact, John Napier owned a castle. Uh, this is just cap his castle. It's just an image in Edinburgh, England. Um, there are three, inven three inventions remain, sextant, chronometer, and logarithms. And these three inventions all from mathematic mathematics theory and greatly used in navigation. Very interesting, the three inventions were made by three Johns, John Bird, John Harrison, and John Napier. It seems like mathematics and navigations are so far from each other, but through three inventions, through the three inventions, they connect together. Usually there are three steps to make a theory to invention. Although it seems very simple, it took much time, hard work, and a determined heart for countless calculations, modeling, and experience. It is an extremely difficult way. So the hope, guidance, and strength from God is is definitely a great hope. Next page. Three Johns plus mathematics produced three inventions. Then three inventions promoted the development of navigation. Three Johns, just like every one of us, we were made by God, and we have creativity, and that's one of the images of God. Mathematics is one of God's principles and laws. It's also created by God. So the human being who was created by God discovered God's principles and laws to make some inventions, then to help us explore God's world more and know him more. Oh, shoot, I'm plugging my lobby, sorry. Uh, 
this is the where we got like the article from. And as you see, navigation this way. Navigation relies heavily on mathematics, three new inventions, navigation, those years possible, the sextant, the chronometer, and logarithms. And thank you. Okay. And then this is verse by Roman. For him and through him and all to him are, are all things to be glory forever. Amen. Okay, thank you. That was that was really great. I, I really love your opening um, slide there. Um, really great choice of um, picture there. And and yeah, I, I it's interesting is three Johns. <laughs> Very good analysis there. Um, yeah, and I really love the Bible verse at the end, and um, it reminds me of the, the other verse that I often think of, the heavens declare the glory of God, right? Everything is so amazing, and they all are shouting out, all declaring the glory of God. Um, you know, from the smallest little insect to, to you know, to the, to the whole, you know, the heavens when you look up at the night sky. Okay, thank you so much. That was really great. Very interesting. Okay, let's see here. All right, and now we will have our sixth group, and that will be Justin, Ian, and Nathan, Navigational Instruments. Hello? Okay, yes. Okay, we're good. Hi, everyone. We're going to tell you, like, we're going to show about early American sailing vessels. And this is by me, Nathan Wang, Justin Cole, and Ian Gong. Introduction. Welcome everyone. Today our group will be talking about the early American sailing for vessels that were used in the early years of our country. For this project, we will be describing three early American sailing vessels, the sloop, the brigantine, and the schooner. We will also show some drawings of these three ships so that you, the audience, can visually see what we are talking about and gain a better understanding of these ships. Sloop. The first ship that we are going to describe is the sloop. A sloop is a sailboat that usually has one mast and is made in an arrangement called a fore and aft rig. When a boat has a fore and aft rig, it means that the boat has one mainsail behind the mast and one head sail in front of the mast. There are many different arrangements called like the gap rig, which has a triangular foresail and a gaff rig mainsail. Though most sloops only have one head sail, the Friendship Sloop is an exception. The Friendship Sloop has many head sails and is also gaff rigged with the bowsprit. Sloops were most commonly used in the 16th and 17th century by pirates. Pirates used these ships because they were fast and agile and also it didn't need a very big crew. Okay, so this is the sloop. Here's the mainsail. One mainsail is small and really agile. Okay, the next ship we have is a brigantine. A brigantine is a sailing vessel with two masts. The four masts, the mast in the front, is fully square. And the main mast, which is the one in the back, has at least two sails on it. It's the taller of the two masts, thus the name, the main mast. Two sails are the top sail, which is square and it's on the top and the gaff sail which is behind the mast the gaff sail is a triangle the old usages of a brigantine just meant a small ship that is swifter and more easier to maneuver than larger ships but in 13th century in the mediterranean sea a brigantine was referred to as an oar and sail driven war vessel 
and so it's easy to maneuver. Mediterranean pirates love it. The name came from the Italian word brigantino, which means bandit in Italian. And here's the brigantine. It has two masts, and the front one is square, and this is the gaff sail on the back, which is kind of like a triangle. Okay. The last ship we have is a schooner. A schooner is a sailing vessel that is defined by the formation of the sails. It has it also has to have at least two masts to be counted as a schooner. The formation of the sails is supposed to be fore and aft rigging, which means that the sail have to be collinear with the keel, which also means that the sail have to be pretty much parallel to the side of the boat, except in the middle. If you don't really understand, instead of the sails being perpendicular to the length of the boat, they are parallel to the side of the boat. But something to note is that there are common variants that have ships, or common variants that have ships that do include square sails. So the schooner could be a ship with only sails that are aligned with the length of the ship, or it could be a mixture of both. And here's the picture. This one has three sails instead of two. Conclusion. Thank you for listening to our presentation on sailing vessels. We hope you learned more about sailing vessels than you knew before, and we hope that you will share our interest in sailing vessels. Throughout our research, this topic fascinated us and interested us to learn more. It interested all of us even more when we found figured out how each ship fit into the story of Nav Fodid. Even though God himself did not create these ships, we can see God's glory in the men who decided to design these ships. Even though men are nowhere near perfect and their creations are certainly flawed, they help us explore more about God's world. If you are interested like we are in these magnificent ships, we challenge you to learn more about them. If you have any questions, please free, free, free feel to ask them now. Oh yeah, wow, great. Yeah, anybody have questions? Seems like these um, guys have done a lot of research into these. Uh, uh, first person I see, Ian, Ian L. So you did mention that in the book, these trips are mentioned. Have you, did you, did you find some places in the book where they, where like they appear? I think they're like, they're one of the, uh, what is this, priv privateers, like, I don't know the exact page, but one of the pages say that, I'm pretty sure it says that one of these privateers, one of these, I'm pretty sure it's sloop or something, they turned it into a war vessel because they're in a war. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Any other questions? Okay. Well, um, if not, we'll, you know, we thank thank you for for that. Um, it, it's, I guess, it, it's interesting that. Well, I really like the the conclusion. By the way, I think that was very insightful what you, what you said there and um so did you all each of you did a different sketch where, where each of you was responsible for one of the drawings uh yeah okay yeah very 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 good so um yeah you know what what you think is it's it's really one of my goals for you know this class too that you would your interest would be piqued in some topic that was touched upon, you know? And so I'm, I'm glad that, that you found that interesting. And yeah, and so I, I was thinking, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking like a boat or a ship is just a boat or a ship, but there's so many different types. And, and I was just remembering like the word snow in English, we, we say snow, but I remember reading in, um, in some some source that in the Eskimo language there's like something like 50 different terms for snow because they describe in detail 
um, you know, different qualities of the smell. So, so now if you, we hadn't known about the different types of ships, now we know some of them, <laughs> right? Okay, thank you. Okay, so we can, I guess you wanna, oh, you want to stop sharing the interesting um, lightning there. Okay, so can I ask you to stop your sharing? And we're gonna have our final group. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Um, all right, so we're going to have um, Isaac and Samuel share about music in early America. Okay, so can I share screen right now? Yes, go ahead. So this is like my transferred version of my Google Docs slide. So this is the early American music. And we're going to tell you about like some of the early American music. So the first slide is instruments. Excuse me. Uh, can you make that full screen? Full screen? Full screen, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, you, uh, Isaac, you need to like press this. I can't see you. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So this, whoa, push up. <laughs> okay, anyways, so, uh, okay. So, so this is, oh, how do I, okay, wait, how do I go up? Okay, in the 1700s, like basically there were lots of instruments and most music were made by playing flutes, lutes, harps, harpsichords, which are like harps that looks like, that looks like pianos and organs. But uh, most of the music were made from these instruments, but lots were also made of woodwinds, like flutes and recorders, and some violins, you know, the strings, and some had percussion, and some brass, like, like for example, the instruments used in barbecue music were from flutes, which is the woodwinds, timpanis, which are percussions, which is like drums where you clash them together and cellos, which are another type of strings, and also trumpets, which are the brass, which you like blow air into them and they come out with a sound. But because the trumpets didn't have valves, which are the things you press, so they could only make one sound. So usually it'll make like a grand opening or a grand ending instead of actually going inside the music. And there are also composers. Oh yeah, and I, I have like three parts. So this is the second part, which is composers. And so there were many pianists, pianists, sorry, in the Barku period, which is the 1600s to 1600s to 1750. But I'm mostly going to talk about Bach, which is Bach was a really famous pianist. And because, sorry, because the piano was invented in somewhere around 1700 and that he was born in, in uh, 1685. So he was already like almost basically 15 years old when he started to play the piano, which is like kind of already pretty old because, you know, if you're younger, then you like learn things faster. But he was already 15 years old, but he grew up to be such a good pianist. Like, and he has lots of amazing pieces. And that's a really amazing fact that I didn't know. I, I had to research that, yeah. And he was also an orphan before he was 10 years old. So he actually was adopted after a while. So yeah, and he also got his first keyboard lessons from an or 
organist, which is someone that plays the organs. And he made many famous pieces that you've probably heard, you know, like the minuet in G major, the one that everyone knows. And people today enjoy his pieces. So he became very, very famous. And there are also lots of types of music and lots of music were played in far too period, but there are different types of music. There was- uh, I think you mean Baroque period. Is that how you, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce things. Is I'm that Baroque? Sure either. That might be Baroque. That's Baroque, right? Oh, I can't hear you. Uh, is it Baroque? So. It's Baroque. A Baroque, okay, sorry. I'm not good with pronouncing. And so lots of music were played in the Baroque period, but there were different types of music. For example, there were preludes, which is like kind of like a short piece that sounds like a little opening. And also concertos, which is like where one instrument is supported by an orchestra. So mostly it's the main instrument that is played is like maybe a piano or a violin, but there will be an orchestra to do the background music to, to uh, you know, to support it. And sonata is a piece with many movements, like first movement will sound completely different from the second movement or maybe the third movement. They sound like different songs, but I mean different pieces, but they're actually all in the same piece. And, Oratorio is a piece that is focused on a special religious theme. So it's like, you know, like maybe for, you know, uh, starry, uh, I mean, what's it called? Like, uh, well, like for Christian, for Christians, it could be like Christmas songs. That will be a kind of oratorio because it's, focus on Christian like when Jesus was born right and mostly that'll be like Christians will be the people who believe in that and so these songs are made for a religious theme and cantata is a is a, a medium length piece that has a voice to sing with it so like have you ever heard of some songs where people sing along with the music that will be a cantata and also opera, which is when someone acts with the music, you probably all know, you go, oh, and make it very, very dramatic. Okay, and that's my last slide. And this is Samuel's slide. So, so okay, wait, I need to, wait. okay. Also, lots of pitches were used to, for example, I forgot how to pronounce this word. Baroque. Baroque music was made from the 1600s to the 1750s. It, music in North Germany was higher than in South Germany. The pitch was high in Rome, but low in Venice. As for France, it depends on what kind of music was played. For, for example, in, ch in chamber music, a um, music that was used that is usually played by only one person at a time and less people. The pitch would be different for from opera music where people act with the music or something else. Okay, so that was uh, Samuel, he told me to write that. And this is the pictures. I sort them out in like types. So this is the types of music, you know, opera, as we talk, chamber music, concerto, sonata, oriato, cantata, and prelude. And then, okay. And then um, this is the pictures about Bach. That's Bach right there. And that's his famous piece, Minuet in G major. And also there were uh, the instruments, which had actually a lot of instruments. So that's Wait, the root. I think you mean batch, not back. Back, back. 
His name is pronounced Bach. Uh, lute, this is a, a lute, which is a kind of instrument. Actually, there will be a glossary later, so you can kind of like see it. But a uh, lute is like kind of like, like a stringed instrument where you like, I don't know how to explain, sorry. Anyways, and harps, you know, the instruments that have strings and you pluck them. Harps are chord, see, it looks like a piano, but instead of like using little hammers to, to uh, tap the strings, it actually pull, uh, pulls and releases the strings to make a uh, harp effect. And also there's woodwinds like a flute or a clarinet where you blow them and cover the holes to uh, make the air come out in different parts that will make different uh, sounds. And violins, where you use like little sticks, you, uh, you... Uh, and the strings are made out of horse hair. Oh, yeah, yep. And you like scrub them on the strings and they make sounds. And timpani is like a drum, you know, a type of drum where you just hit it and make sounds. Cello, another type of string, and a trumpet, which is, well, you you guys all know. <laughs> and um, this is the oops, sorry, glossary, the first part of it. So <laughs> I forgot, but Baroque, no, Baroque, Baroque, okay. So yeah, Baroque is, these will be the meanings, lutes and the sound hole. A uh, Tiffany, yeah, I already explained these, but you can still look at them for a while. And the second part is over here, the glossary continue. And these are the like second and third part of mine. And that's basically it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was also very, very informative. Um, I, I'm remembering a, a visit to George Washington's estate and in, in Mount Vernon. And if you go to go on a tour and the tour guide brings you around and then he says, this is the entertainment room. And of course, it, it wouldn't be a big screen TV or, you know, a, a lot of things we, we would associate with entertainment today, but it was instruments. Okay, so, okay, well, that, that was really great. Um, I, I really, I, I actually, I feel like it, it, there's like an information overload today because there's so much um, coming at us, but I, I, I really appreciate all of you spending time to research these topics and to um, your, your creativity in presenting. Um, I, I also want to, yeah, so, so actually why don't you all give yourselves an applause, you know, it was really very interesting um, and actually the culmination of five weeks. I know we started this in week one, okay, and you worked little by little. Um, it, it was supposed to help you to, you know, learn how to pace yourself. Okay, so we started off with the topic and just some notes, outline, and first draft, second draft, and final draft, um, and then this presentation. So, yeah, um, I, I also want to mention that we on Google Classroom, and we also talked about this um, on Tuesday, that you know we're finishing up this class, but you're going to going into your next academic school year, right? And I, will, I really encourage you to fill out this form, which is on Google Classroom. And it was, it's, we talked about it on Tuesday, goals for 920, oh, I'm sorry, the one I'm holding is not great, 920, 21 to, to 6, 2022. Um, and remember the very first verse, that I always bring up, which is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. 
in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. And then a very wonderful verse as well, Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I, I think we see from Nat Bowditch's life that he, again, it's not directly a Christian book, but we learn a lot about how to live as a Christian from this book, right? And you can see that he's not living um, selfishly. If he was selfish, I think he would, he might have even, you know, run away at some point or just, you know, closed his, his heart and his mind to, to many opportunities. Um, but he, he did what was right. And in the end, he blessed him, other people and blessed himself. So the goal sheet that we talked about on Tuesday and also was on Google Classroom, I really would like to encourage you to think about your spiritual goals for this coming school year. Um, how also in, in your character, maybe you want to develop more patience or um, learn to persevere, you know, focus on persevering. Sorry to interrupt, Alina. I see Isaac has been raising his hand. You have a question, Isaac? Well, uh, after Mrs. Chen is like done talking. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, relationships, maybe there, there's a, a family member or a friend that you feel like, oh, I, I really want to um, have a better relationship with them, you know? And, uh, and then the third item on this list is physical health. Maybe you want to commit to swimming every, every, you know, a few times a week or, or something like that. Um, and then the fourth I have on the list is academics which, you know, we usually, when we think about goals, we, we, at least at this stage in your lives, we usually put it at the very top, but it really is down there at number four, I would say. And then after that, other goals you might have, like maybe you wanna learn how to uh, whittle <laughs> or you wanna learn how to sew or, or something, you know? So I, I encourage you to, to look carefully and, and think through this and even sign it at the bottom and you know, make a commitment to it. Put it on your bulletin board in front of you, and and above it, you know, the 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 Bible verse that will be above it will be trust in the Lord, and the fear of the Lord. Um, so we want to get our thoughts off of ourselves and really think about how, how what is our role in God's kingdom, and that will actually solve a lot of problems because we, we will know how to make decisions and we will be a much more joyful person because we won't be thinking about, you know, what, what is the effect on me so much, but you know, how is God gonna use this experience? Um, and what, you know, how can I be diligent in this situation? So, you know, thank you all for, for joining um, the class over the five weeks and, um, yeah, I guess that that's what I want to say. And so I'll pass the time to Pastor Lenny. He's going to say a few words and close us in prayer. Uh, Isaac, you have some question? Oh, that's right, Isaac. Um, can we pray first? <laughs> and then I'll do something. How about we pray first? Oh, okay. <laughs> do you, you want to say some words to us? <laughs> Lenny, uh, Pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will, I, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wow. What a great works. I'm so impressed by all your hard works. And I hope you carry this experience to do all other things. You know, not just learn this book, but learn the way you learn and the attitude. I want to commend all of you and uh, especially also the helper, and Wendy and Ian. Um, and all the parents, thank you for your support. Uh, I hope this experience really will benefit and you remember this summer 2021 English lecture literature class. Okay, let's conclude with a prayer. 